the opening karakia and anyone is welcome to join with me. Whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tai, e hi aka ana te atakura. He teo teo, he hoka, he hohu, tihe mari ora. So welcome everyone to today's regulatory processes committee meeting and I will do specific welcome shortly. Please note that the meeting is being live streamed and welcome to anyone who happens to be watching it right now or watches it at a later stage. Please let me or democracy services, services know if you intend to leave the meeting. So I've received apologies from Mayor Foster and from Deputy Mayor Free, who I don't think has joined us yet for lateness. She will be joining us soon. So I move the motion that we accept the apology from Mayor Foster. Seconder, please. Councillor Matthews, thank you. I put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. And I haven't got my little... Right. I don't see any green ticks. We're getting there. <laughs> Right, I'm looking at the, anyway, my hand's raised. I think that's probably unanimous. I declare the motion carried. Conflict of interest declarations. I call on members to declare any conflicts of interest they may have in relation to any item on the agenda. Okay, in confirmation of minutes, we our last meeting was only um, seven days ago. So I move that we approve the minutes of that meeting held on the 8th of September, having been circulated they'd be taken as read and confirmed as an accurate record of that meeting. Seconder, please. Councillor O'Neill, thank you. I put the motion which has been moved and seconded. Please vote accordingly. Right, that is carried, thank you. There are no items not on the agenda. With my hand is down. And there is no public participation at this meeting, or no unscheduled public participation. There is no, just a little, a few words from me at the outset, there is no record of a hearing of this nature and objection to a menacing dog classification in the past 15 years plus. So we're covering new ground. And but unfortunately, the hearing is on Zoom. I would much prefer it to be on per in person, but the reality is it's not. So please bear with me if there are a few hiccups along the way, and there may well be. Before we go any further, I will introduce the various participants at this hearing, and I will introduce each councillor, and perhaps you can give a little wave or whatever at that stage. So the committee, this committee, and this is for um, Brian Tressida's benefit as much as anyone, comprises Councillor Malcolm Sparrow, that's me, Chair. Councillor Simon Wolf, Deputy Chair. Deputy Mayor Sarah Free, who will arrive shortly. Well, the Mayor, of course, but he has already put in an apology for absence. Councillor Jenny Condy. Councillor Rebecca Matthews. Councillor Terry O'Neill and Mana Fenua representative Liz Kelly. So it's good to have you all along. And on the public health side and animal control side, could you please introduce yourself? So I'll leave it to you to individually introduce yourselves right now, please. And we can't hear anything yet. Oh, 
Apologies for that. Good afternoon, councillors. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. And good afternoon, Mr. Treasurer. Um, my name's Helen Jones, and I'm the Public Health Manager at Wellington City Council. And that's me. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jude Austin. I'm the team leader in the Public Health Unit. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Damien Nunns. I'm the Animal Services Team Leader um, for Wellington. Good afternoon. My name is Wayne Batty, and I'm an Animal Control Officer with Animal Services. Okay, thank you very much for that. <clears throat> we have the owner of Dog Breaker, Brian Tressida. So, welcome along, Brian. <clears throat> we also have other council officers in attendance. Ones I have listed here are the executive leadership team member, Liam Hodgetts, Heidi Muller in the background. Oh, hello, Liam. And Sean Officer Johnson, who is right alongside me. So I'm currently in the council building. And other officers whose names are on the screen. Welcome to you all. Back to business. A classification of a menacing dog was placed on the dog breaker, on the dog whose name is Breaker, by Wellington City Council's public health team at the end of June. Brian Tresider, the dog's owner, has appealed that classification. And the role of this committee is to listen to the evidence and after deliberating, decide whether to uphold or rescind that classification. And I need to make it clear at this point that some of our questions to both public health and animal control officers and to Mr. Tressida will be very direct, very challenging, hopefully not impolite. But our role is to gain a full understanding of why this classification has been placed on the dog to enable us to, to help us intelligently make our decision. So at that point, well, the order, the order of proceedings will be as follows. Council's public health team will speak and then councillors will have the opportunity to ask any questions. Then Brian Tressida will speak and councillors will have the opportunity to ask any questions of him. Public health will then respond to what has Brian Tressida has said and councillors can then ask further questions. Then Brian Tressida will respond and councillors have the final opportunity to ask any questions of him. Is that all fair? Um, Understood. Okay, and at that stage we will adjourn, and the our committee will have deliberate on the matter with the public excluded. But that session will be fully minuted, and once we've had a chance to talk, we will then and made a decision of sorts. We will then resume this meeting and debate the motion as per the usual procedures. So that's um, the order of proceedings. And like I said in my email a short while ago, I don't know whether this meeting will take one hour or four hours, but we will do what we need to do to ensure that the matter is dealt with fairly and appropriately. Okay, at that point, I think it's time to invite the representatives of Wellington City Council's public health team and animal control team, namely Helen Jones, Jude Austin, named, sorry, Damian Nunn and Wayne Batty to make any statements and to answer any questions from councillors. So I will hand it over to your team a moment ago, one or two of you, I was slightly struggling to hear, but I will interrupt you if I'm, <laughs> maybe it's just my deafness. If we're struggling, if I'm struggling to hear you, I will let you know. Otherwise, it is over to you, and this session will be uninterrupted. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, councillors, again. Um, this matter will be led by Jude Austin. So Jude Austin is the team leader in my team, and it's her team that deals with um, dog registration and indirectly with the animal control officers who deal with field services. So Jude is going to run over a summary of the case and then open it up to questions at the end. I'll pass you over to Jude. Excuse me, can I say at this point, is there any chance of having slightly greater volume because I can hear you, but it's a wee bit of an effort. If we can't do that, I would just have to make the effort. Maybe we could just move you a little bit closer, Councillor. But we'll speak up as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors. This matter is in relation to a menacing classification placed on Mr. Tressida's dog, Breaker. Key points to note in relation to this matter are as follows. The Wellington City Council Consolidated Bylaw requires dogs to be on lead in most public areas, including the area where the attack occurred, being the lookout part on Bernard and Lenal Streets. And, on, and the Dog Control Act requires dogs to be under control of their owner at all times. The complainant was bitten by a breaker who was off lead and not controlled in an on-leash area. The complainant suffered a moderate injury that took several months to heal, including under the care of a district nurse. His medical records describe the injury as a dog bite with deep puncture wounds on the complainant's leg and a large flap of skin, which was left hanging from the complainant's leg. Mr. Evans has also stated that on a separate occasion, Mr. Tresider himself has received an injury from Breaker and the blood left on the street led to some police attention. I have not questioned around the police attention or this matter. Mr. Tresider originally says he had his back to his dog, walking away from him at the time of the attack and therefore did not see the accident. He subsequently went on to say that Breaker did not attack George and the incident lasted only five seconds. Mr. Tresider has a history of non-compliance with the Dog Control Act in so much as he's received a written warning for having his dog off lead in the past. At the time of this warning being issued, the dog was also unregistered. He was given seven days to register the dog. There is also supporting information that Breaker has rushed at the complainant's neighbour. Whilst, whilst off lead, the neighbour was on a scooter at the time and the dog lunged at him as he rode past. Mr. Tresider has breached sections 5 and 63 of the Dog Control Act 1996, which are to ensure that the dog is kept under control at all times, and to the owner of a dog shall be liable for any damage done by the dog. He has also been issued with a breach of section 57 notice. At the, as a result of the incident, the animal control team placed a menacing classification on the dog breaker using an attack rating report. The attack rating report is a robust and consistent rating process that ensures that the Wellington City Council meets its obligations under section 33A. Territorial authority may classify a dog as menacing. In summary, Wellington City Council has an obligation to ensure public safety and that they are protected from aggressive animals that can cause, that can cause serious harm. It also must take relevant steps under the Dog Control Act to ensure that no further harm will occur in relation to this dog. Are there any questions? Do we have any questions from councillors? Because I have quite a few, but you can certainly ask them first. Um, I saw Deputy Mayor freeze hand up first. Yes, um, you mentioned the uh, neighbour who on the scooter. Um, how confident, uh, I know that the neighbour sent in a photograph of the dog that that looked like a collie, um, but how confident are you that, that you can say that uh, that incident was um, breaker? 
There was we didn't have enough of evidence to infringe, but we, we were the uh, the offence and the dog description is significantly similar, and we are, we are confident based on that. Thank you. Councillor Condi. Thanks, I have many questions, so I'll just ask a few to start with and then hand off to someone else. Um, just following up on Deputy Mayor's question about the scooter incident, um, was that information that you had at the time that you made the medicine classification? Because in the document pack that we have, um, that that statement was made only after the medicine classification was made. So can you talk to us about whether you knew about that prior to this incident or prior to the medicine classification? Yeah, that is correct. It only came to our attention on the 7th of July, I believe, which is why it's not entered as evidence. It's entered as supplementary information. So, so that wasn't information that you had when you made the medicine classification? No. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess for me, the, it's obvious that um, these two dogs had an incident that um, Mr. Evans sustained a dog bite. And the question is fundamentally, how confident can we be about which dog um, bit Mr. Evans? So I guess my question to you is, is on what evidence did you base your conclusion that it was Breaker that was the dog that bit Mr. Evans? I'll refer you to Damien Nunn's team leader. Bye. Can everyone hear me all right? The um, evidence we had was supply was um, from Gary Evans. Um, he was the only witness to the dog bite. When we questioned him about was he at which which dog actually bit him, was he adamant with that? He kept saying that yes, the dog breaker was the um, was the dog that bit him. It definitely was not his own dog. That was his opinion. Unfortunately, Mr. Tresida had his back towards the incident and was unable to provide that detail. And, and also, Mr. Tresida stated that when he did turn around, that George, Mr. Evans's dog, had fur in his mouth. So he had perhaps been defending himself against the dog and not Mr. Evans. Um, thank you. I the wife was also on the scene. I understand she was holding George's leash. Um, so was she not a witness to what happened? It's, it's sort of my question is, uh, why did we not get a witness statement from her? Why is that not in the pack? That was, um, I did not feel that at the time that she would have given a different uh, count of events. I thought they would probably be the same. Um, Final question just for now, and then I'll hand off to the next person on the list. But um, this incident, it seems to me, would, would have happened quite likely quite quickly. It might have been a bit chaotic. Um, is it reasonable to think that, and obviously no one wants to think that their own dog has bitten anyone. So I'm, I'm kind of saying, obviously, Mr. Evans is not going to want to believe it was his dog that bit him. He's going to want to believe it was the other dog. So how much chaos do we have in this sort of incident and how confident can we be about his recollection? His recollection on the day that I spoke to him was quite clear. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Liz Kelly, your turn. Oh, kia ora. thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so, I did have a couple of questions, but um, they have been raised. So one of the, the key ones that I wanted to ask of the officers is, have we followed our policy process? Yes. Yes. And, and, and its entirety. We haven't diverted in any way at all from what our policy process is. No, it's, it's all... Um specified under, was it the um, menacing dog classifications in the Act, uh, which then refers us, our process is the attack rating report, which is Appendix 11. Okay, thank, thank you. That's, I just wanted to be, um, to have that confirmed, to be confident that um, our policy and process has been followed to the letter. 
So I'm really quite interested to hear why this has been appealed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I will ask a few of my many questions right now. So my first one is um, directed to Animal Control Officer uh, Wayne Batty, who visited Brian Tresseter on the 25th of May. Did you did you actually get to see Breaker at that point, please? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, the dog was present uh, when I visited. And what was your impression of the dog at that point in time? Uh, well, the dog showed no aggression towards me uh, when I was talking to Mr. Tresider. Okay, thank you. Just out of interest, have any other members of the um, animal control or public health team seen or interacted with Breaker at all? Previously. No, only myself uh, previously um, on the day I issued the written warning for his dog being off lead on Oriental Bay. Okay, oh, that was you that did that because that was um, yeah, yes. blocked out. Okay, thank you. I had another question, um, which has already been asked, but about the statement from the only other witness to the incident, namely Mr. Evans' wife, Isabel. Now, I think the response to that was you assumed that she would give much the, the same information, but is it reasonable to assume, or might she have looked at it from a slightly different point of view? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Moving on then. Can I just add to that, that Mr. Evans has said that um, in his um, emails since that his wife is quite um, afraid or apprehensive of going for a walk um, after the incident due to the fact that they have seen Breaker out there again off lead. Wow. Yes, I have read that, thank you. All right, Mr. Mr. Evans received an injury while trying to break up the dogs fighting. This is quoting directly from the report. Possibly redirected aggression from the dog fight. Can you just elaborate on what redirected aggression from the dog fight means exactly? Redirected um, means that the dogs are possibly in a, a frenzy of um, attack, if you like. Uh, teeth are lashing and the closest thing generally gets bitten, uh, whether that be a leg or a hand or another thing, because the dogs are quite worked up and the redirection can be a lash out at even a helping hand. Does that make sense? It, it does, but does that kind of say that um, the dog didn't necessarily have it in for for Mr. Mr. Evans, this is the dog breaker, didn't have it in for Mr. Evans, that he was, well, in a sense, collateral damage, not downplaying the extent of his injuries. That is a possibility. However, I think we're missing the fact that um, Mr. Evans said that the dog attacked his dog as well first. So there was aggression there. Whether it's aggression at persons or animals or domestic animals, protected wildlife, the menacing classification covers the, the series. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, one of my questions it follows on from the comment you made. You said that his recollection on the day I spoke to him was quite clear. Um, can you tell us um, how when you spoke to him, how often you spoke to him leading prior to the email that you received? Because the email train, chain that we have in, in our pack starts with, as discussed. So obviously you'd had prior conversations with him. Can you just fill us in on, on the what happened before the email chain started? Sure. So uh, we received the complaint uh, by the Wellington City Council uh, system, uh, the Fresh Service system. I rang Mr. Uh, Evans to discuss the matter with him. Um, I asked him to 
uh, tell me the incident and how it broke down. Now, this was, I'm going from memory here, I think it was four days or so after the incident. He didn't report it straight away. Um, and uh, he virtually gave me blow by blow of how the incident took place. I questioned him at the time. Are you sure that, you know, how sure are you that the dog that bit you was breaker and not your own? And at that time, he quickly responded, I am absolutely positive that the dog breaker bit me. That did not even have any hesitation or waiver at any stage through the, the investigation. Thanks. Do you recall when you spoke to him, did you ask him about whether um, George had lunged at Breaker when he approached? There was no um, mention of that. And at the time, um, um, I, I didn't ask him, no, I did not, because that hadn't come up at that point. Yeah. Um, he, was, he, he was on lead as well. Yeah. Um, Sorry, you, can, you, can you repeat that question, um, Councillor Condi? I didn't quite catch it. Oh, I, I asked whether um, whether the officer asked Mr Evans whether George had lunged towards Breaker. So Mr Tresider has said in his statement that he believes that George, even though he was on lead, lunged towards Breaker. Um, and then I guess another question I have is, did you ask him, um, Mr Evans at the time, whether... George was adequately under control because in his statement he kind of talks about being worried his wife is going to get pulled over. She's holding the leash, as I understand it, and he's concerned that she might be pulled over, which doesn't to me indicate a dog under control. So can you can you unpack that for me as well? Yeah, sure. That statement was um, to do when the two dogs were fighting. That he stepped in uh, to help the situation because he thought his wife Isabel was going to lose the fall over. But that is while the two dogs were fighting. Now, both dogs are of similar size and would be quite a heavy weight for an older person. Yes, definitely. Um, if we could just go on to the, the visit when you went to, to visit Mr. Tresida to inform him of this complaint. Um, can you just talk us through kind of what, what happened? Did you contact him before you went to see him at his home? What happened when you went to see him at his home? Um, from what I understand, uh, contact had not, been, had not been made. Hence was the reason why I went to the address. <clears throat> and I uh, informed Mr. Um, Tresida that we had received a complaint um, that his dog had attacked another dog and also attacked the other dog's owner, <clears throat> um, causing uh, moderate injuries. And he informed me that he believed that the injury that had been caused to the other dog owner was only a scratch. And at that point, I asked him if he could supply a statement uh, to animal services, which he did a few hours later. Thank you. At that time, um, did you make it clear to Mr. Tresida what the process was for the investigation that would follow up and how he should participate? Uh, yes, I did. Yep. I informed him that <clears throat> uh, once we had uh, received his uh, statement and received the other statement from the uh, complainant, uh, we would carry out a full investigation. Thank you. And did you make it clear to Mr. Tressida kind of the seriousness of the potential consequences from this investigation? Did you talk at that time about what the outcome might be if, if it was found that Breaker had <clears throat> bitten Mr. Evans? Um, I didn't want to make any assumptions. Um, that comes after the after we make the recommendations and stuff, that comes at the end of the investigation. So, okay. yeah. And then just my, I've got one, my last question for now, which is just, um, why did we not provide Mr. Tresida with a statement of the complaint? Is that, uh, is that normal process that we wouldn't normally provide him with a statement from the complainant? That is correct. We would not normally provide a statement to the <laughs> other uh, witness. Could you explain why that is? 
we need independent um, and confidentiality. We need independent um, statements, and we wanted to hear in their own words what they saw or witnessed, and also confidentiality. Cool. Thank you. I'll hand over to Liz. Yeah. Liz. I am muted. Yeah, can't buy. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just following on from my, my first question, um, which was confirming that we have followed all our um, processes, I, I um, would like to ask them, because I've had another look and I, I don't know, have I missed it? What are the grounds for this appeal? If all our processes have been followed, and we have um, acted within the Act and, um, you know, we've followed all the things that we should do and our staff have, have um, done what they need to do. What, what are the grounds? Is, through you, Mr Chair, can I ask that of the... Am I asking you or am I asking the officers? Well, I, my understanding is that it, it, it is his right to um, for an objection to be listened to. You are indeed but, right, Councillor. The Dog Control Act provides for a person to object to a medicine classification if it's been placed on their dog. So it's a legislative right. Okay, okay. So so um, that, that then means that now a precedent has been set we could potentially expect this again. We could potentially, yes. Thank you. I, I look forward to hearing um, from Mr. Tristita. Okay, I have, um, I have a, just a few more questions at this stage and then we will move on. On page 20, it states that as a result of the investigation, the Office of Fines, and at that point, there are four factors listed, which include Tressida failed to keep Breaker under control. Tressida was not walking Breaker on lead. I'm quoting precisely at this point. Plus, there are two more. Now, there is no disputing those facts, as far as most of us are concerned, I, I, I think it's fair to say. And one of those has already been dealt with and the owner penalised accordingly. But I'm interested in knowing why those factors are immediately linked to the next recommendation that Breaker be classified as a menacing dog. Because those are, fa are faults on the part of the, the owner, are they not? Or do they have a direct bearing on determining the nature of the dog, which is being described as menacing? Are they not separate issues? Maybe they're not. That's why I'm asking. No, they're question. not separate issues. Sorry, um, they're not separate issues. They're all um, consideration when we have to take into account the level of compliance. When when you look at the attack rating report, part of it is has things happened before. Like what is the level of compliance with the dog owner? So there's um, previous history is taken into account, and that is on the appendix eleven two. Um, and we also had to assess recurrence of recurrence likelihood. So that's why they're all sort of um, matters that have to be taken into account when they're when they're doing the attack rating. Okay, thank you, Councillor O'Neill. Um, kia ora. My question was uh, surrounding the Labrador dog, and if within taking into account, we also look at um, the traits of the other dog. If this was just a conflict between two dogs, would we then be looking at the Labrador as menacing at the same time? Or because um, the, the um, collie attacked another human? Um, yeah, how does, how does that kind of play out? And also um, preliminary to that, did the Labrador sustain any injuries from what evolved, or was that documented at any point? Um, there were no injuries on the Labrador, um, and that is quite normal for 
dog attacks to dog on dog, the injuries with the, the skin of a dog being a lot more um, tougher than human skin. We quite often deal with dog attacks where dogs do not cause injury to other dogs. Um, we did not think of classifying uh, the Labrador because A, it was on lead and under control. The dog uh, breaker approached the Labrador. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, can you excuse, bear with me just a brief Okay, just a slight hiccup there, which we were negotiating our way around. Okay, I think we're almost out of questions here. Look, I do want to, um, I, I can either ask this later or ask it now, and I think I might ask it now. Just on this business of um, the, the frenzied attack and the, the injury to Mr. Evans. Now, it does clearly say here that um, animal control is satisfied that Breaker, amongst other things, rushed both Mr. Evans and George. On the other hand, Mr. Tresseter asserts that Breaker went to say hello and a fight ensued from there. Now let's for the moment assume that Breaker did rush the other dog, George. Animal, con animal control is stating that Breaker rushed Mr. Evans and George, and that's the order in which it is stated. In other words, he had it in for both of them. Now, would it not be more accurate, harking back to the um, question and answer a little while ago, would it not be more accurate that if Breaker did in fact do any rushing, it was at George alone? And I think there is a distinction here. After all, Mr. Evans was walking behind his wife, the dog, who was the dog handler. So at that point, he was separated by a meter or two or a few, I don't know, perhaps you can tell us the answer, from, from his dog, George. So the dog, George, was rushed at, if we accept that, and Mr. Tressida doesn't accept that, but he has, will have the chance to refute that shortly. But what I'm asking is whether we accept that it was George that was rushed out, it was not Mr. Evans and George. Uh, the, the, the rushing comes, comes out of the Act. It's one of the sections of the Act from when a dog rushes either a person or another animal. So that's where that comes as part of the legislation. How Mr. Tresider could, um, I would argue Mr. Tresider is saying that George went to say hello when he had his back to the dog and was walking away from the dog. But I guess the point I'm making is, or okay, I'm asking is whether it's fair to say he rushed, the dog rushed both of them. Okay, perhaps you've answered that. I'll leave it at that in the meantime. Councillor Condi. Thanks again. Um, just about the, the injury and when Mr. Evans was bitten on his calf, we've got a photograph of an pack that shows the injury, but it's quite zoomed in. Like you can't actually see kind of where it is on his leg. And I was just wondering if, um, if the location of the injury on his leg is consistent with where Breaker was standing, if you know what I mean, like consistent with where the dog was standing, that it was, that that would make sense. I'll refer you to the, the medical report um, from his treatment. It tells you the location of the injury, I believe it's the calf, uh, which is the lower part of the leg, of course. So Yeah, I, yeah. I just meant more specifically than that, like whether it was on his left to calf, his right, you know, which side of his leg it was on. But I believe we may not it's have that in the medical report. Right calf. Yeah. But it doesn't say on which part of which part of his leg, it just says on that right leg. Right. The okay. right calf. All right. Um, yeah. I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about some of the paperwork that's been filled in. Um, at one point in your report, 
it's on page 43 of our papers. I'm sorry, I don't know what pages is on your papers, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, it, it states that the complainant, Mr. Evans, was in control of the dog, George. But then it seems to me in other places and the conversation that we've had is, in fact, that, the, that um, Mr. Evans' wife was holding the lead and was the one in control of the dog. Is that a mistake? That must be. It was definitely Isabel, his wife, that was walking the dog on the lead. Yeah. Um, another question about the paperwork. There's an investigating officer checklist at one point where it kind of goes through and says, is there a witness statement? Is there this? Is there that? Um, and there's a, a column that says, if no, provide explanation. Um, but actually that table wasn't filled in correctly. It wasn't um, where, where, for example, the witness statement wasn't taken from the wife. There was no explanation provided there about why that statement wasn't provided. Can you talk to us about why that table was filled in the way that it was? Wow. It's just an omission. Sorry. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions for now, Malcolm. Thank you. I have just one last question at this stage, and that is, um, I asked by email a couple of days ago whether the, whether, got to get these dogs around the right way, the breaker um, had been neutered, and I was given the response, no, not according to our records, but then when I was reading through the papers again today, I happened to come across a box that had been ticked, which indicated that he had he had been D6. Now, obviously, we'll get an answer from Mr. Tressida shortly, but... I, too, noticed that, Councillor Sparrow, and that is completely my fault. Oh, OK, so... Um, it's not, as, far as, we are aware, uh, as far as we are aware, he is not D6. And as far as Mr. Tressida is aware, he hasn't been because um, he was shaking his head a moment ago. Right. Okay, look, I think at this point it's appropriate to hand over to, I see there are no more questions. We will have the, oh, would you like to ask one now, Liz? Oh, just uh, just based on your question, what's the relevance of you asking that question to, to, the, to the dog being menace, menacing? I don't know whether I have to answer that question at this point. Your questions... We're directing questions to the... Um, oh, I'm just trying to understand your thinking of, right. of um, how that um, is relevant to menacing. I will, I will explain later. I have a valid reason for asking that question. I will explain that later when we have a chance to deliberate. Well, sorry, deliberate. perhaps could we ask, because I was going to, I had a similar question and saw that you had asked it, but maybe the animal control officers can talk about um, why desexing a dog might make it less aggressive? Because that's my understanding. Um, just before we move on, since that might help Liz understand why you wanted to know. That is a good question that Councillor Condi is asking. So over to uh, Animal Control Public Health to answer that one. Sure. Um, not only is it part of the legislation that a dog has to be desexed according to the menacing classification in Wellington City, but um, a desex dog um, has, has, it's been scientifically proven that a D6 dog um, has reduced aggression to others, um, whether it be other dogs, are generally less territorial and um, can be a more settled pet, if you like. Um, when, a, when they're uh, left entire, as we say, or not D6, um, dogs can be a bit more instinctual. Yeah, that was my understanding too. Okay, thank you for that. Right, we shall hand over to Mr. Tressida to um, present his case. Hello? Right. Yeah, who's on the room? Great, thank you. I've been told I have to wear the mask for the entirety of the time I'm here, so I hope you can hear me okay. Um, kia ora kato katoa. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. And first, I am actually sorry that the complainant was hurt and that our dog breaker is always on a lead now. The main reason I'm here isn't about dogs, but 
fairness and to put sunlight on the process that led to this. The council's evidence say I didn't see the attack as I was walking away at the time. The complainant's dog has lunged at Breaker probably three times previously, and I would note that apparently he hasn't been de-sexed either. Um, and two un-de-sexed dogs put together is a potentially um, a bad situation. Um, so, I, um, because of that, um, I walked away into the triangle, but when I heard the first growl, I didn't call Breaker, so he was probably confused about what he wanted me to do. Um, so in his confusion, he ran to see the complainant's dog, because Breaker is actually very sociable. I heard the first growl and turned, and I saw the whole fight, which lasted about five seconds. I saw the complainant's wife trying to pull George, their dog, away from Breaker. I would note that as the only other witness, the complainant's wife has not provided any evidence, although I do actually understand her not doing so. I saw the complainant standing beside Breaker. Um, so he's facing me. Breaker's head is here, tail here. And Mr. Evans is pushing his bare leg because he was wearing shorts into um, Breaker's neck mane. He's got a like very long, hairy neck. Um, council emailed the complainant on the 24th of May, Mr. Nunn's I think perhaps, um, asking for a statement and, and what it needed to cover, including what you and the owner did to break it up. The complainant never answered this question as to his own actions, but in a later email that same day, says that I did not assist and did not move off the lookout. I was about 15 metres away on the other side of a low fence, so my best option was to call Breaker, and he was blocked in position with the complainant's dog in front, a bank and a fence to his left, and the complainant to his right. And I quote the complainant statement here, the dog then viciously turns its, turned its attention to me. Breaker extracted himself when I called by rearing up on his hind legs, pivoting with his back towards the complainant or against the complainant perhaps, and then down and ran back to me. So at no point, as the, as the um, complainant says, viciously turned his attention on the complainant. After the fight, the complainant nor his wife noticed the injury immediately. He looked down at his leg and he noticed some bleeding and said he would have to return home. And then he turned around and began to walk back towards his house. The complainant's dog was unhurt, um, despite having been attacked in a vicious manner. And as that's Mr. Um, Evans's words, and uh, you had a clump of breaker's fur in his mouth. And I asked if I could help, but was just told, just told to just keep that dog away from me. I didn't see the injury, but I saw him show a bloodied handkerchief to his wife as he walked away as she seemed confused about what was going on. I was visited, um, I think, I don't know if it was the 24th or the 25th, Mr. Batty, I think you said 25th, um, by Mr. Batty and told I needed to provide a statement, but I had to ask him who to send it to as he prepared to leave. And that was the last I heard about it until the notice of menacing dog classification arrived in the mail. I didn't even receive an acknowledgement of receipt of my statement. On the other hand, the council officer and the complainant continued to contact each other subsequent to that. I found the officer's report to be biased towards the complainant's emotive and short on detail statement. And well, it cherry picked from my statement, which was made without knowledge of the complainant's allegations. 
and it um, seemed to try and make it seem that I didn't see and didn't care. I actually think it's most likely that the complainant was accidentally bitten by his own dog while his leg was buried in Breaker's fur in his neck. So thank you for your time. Well, that's me. Thank you, Mr. Prisoner. I expect we have a few questions. I have a few. Well, look, I'll, I will ask one at the outset and then give others the opportunity. And that is that you've, you've stated that George has, uh, yeah, George has, just making sure I'm getting this around the right way. George has sometimes responded aggressively to Breaker's friendly greetings, but you say that it was George who first lunged at Breaker as he has done several times in the past. And George often gets aggressive when Breaker does the usual dog greeting. So my question is, and I ask this with respect, why on earth did you walk away when you saw George approaching and expect Breaker to follow you? Would it not have been the sensible thing to do to have immediately called Breaker or to have physically removed him from proximity to George? And I ask this being a dog owner myself, would you have not, would you not have wanted to ensure that there wasn't any aggression takes place on the part of either if you know that it has happened in the past? Um. In answer to that, um, I did intend Breaker to follow me, but in a moment of absent-mindedness, um, I thought he would. I had a stick in my hand, and I sort of waved that. Um, he's, he's very obedient, usually under control, but in, as I say, in a, perhaps in a moment of absent-mindedness, I, I neglected to call him, um, and he's run off in the other direction. And... Um, Yes, so you're right. I have called him, but um, I neglected to in that in that occasion. Okay, Councillor Matthews. Um, Mr. Tressida, I'm just wondering. Um, the complainant mentioned that you were bleeding and that there was blood in the street. And what's your response to that? Um, that was just, um, I have some varicose veins in my leg and I was actually in the same area at the time. And um, rather than um, go home, he likes to try and grab me around the, around the ankle with his paws um, to uh, stop me going home. And all that happened was that he just um, scratched one of the varicose veins in my leg and it started to bleed quite profusely. Thank you, Councillor Condi. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Mr. Tressida. Um, in your statement, you said that when Mr. Batty came to your house he, um, to inform you of the incident, that he did tell you that um, Mr. Evans had required some stitches to this injury. Is that correct? Um, that was after... I, I said that it was, um, as he mentioned, just a scratch, because from my perspective, the only way that breaker, because I, I, after the incident, when Mr. Evans said, just keep that dog away from me, that was my first indication that as his, in his impression, breaker had caused the injury. Um, and I thought that the only way it could have happened is when breaker leapt up with his back to him, would be he could have caused the scratch with one paw as he was going up, his um, right paw, or on Mr. Evans' leg with his left paw when he came down. Um, that's why I, I had assumed that it was a scratch. But then, as you say, Mr. Batty did inform me at that stage that it was um, a, uh, a bite yeah. that required so stitch. That required stitches, yeah. So when you spoke to Mr. Batty, he told you it was a bite that required stitches. Yes. Um, but well, later that evening... He didn't say bite. Sorry. He said, he said, he said injury. it required stitches. Yes, you're correct. I apologise. He said that he'd been injured and it required stitches. Um, but in your email that you sent after that conversation, you still made the comment about um, perhaps it was caused by a stray claw. Do you want to explain what you were thinking about then? Um. As I just said, um, I thought maybe it was a scratch. And, you know, like old people's skin is quite fragile. 
Um, so I thought it may have been a scratch that needed stitches. Um, I didn't realize it was a bite. And one thing I'd like to add at this point is if you look at the picture of the bite, a, um, a rough collie has a long, narrow snout. Um, and to me, the, um, the bite looks more like it's been inflicted by a, a dog like a Labrador rather than a rough collie. I'll just ask one more question, Mr. Tresseter, and then we'll hand you over to someone else. Um, can you just talk to us about uh, when, did you feel like when Mr. Batty came to your home and spoke to you about it, did you feel that you really um, understood the seriousness of the, of the, the complaint that was being made against Breaker at that time? No, I did not. No, I, I didn't um, because um, I had no idea that, I, you know, I just, I know what I saw during the fight and I, I didn't, I had no idea what um, Mr. Evans had alleged. Um, so I, I possibly did, I did not know the seriousness of it. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Free. Yes, thank you for coming to speak to us, Mr. Tresider. Um, I, I note that you say that dogs that haven't been de-sexed can be dangerous when they get together. And I was a little bit um, taken aback to see in your statement that you regretted not keeping Raker on a leash and that you would do in future, apart from when you're in an off-leash dog area. And I wonder how safe you really think it would be for uh, Breaker to be in an off-leash dog area um, given some of the behavior that you've identified can happen? Um, well, as dog owner, it, um, it does happen from time to time. He has been attacked, but um, I, I just, I, I balance that with um, his freedom to just run around and, and be a dog. Um, and he, his, his nature, he, sorry, He's a very good-natured dog, so it's never really been an issue with us. We never denatured him um, because we thought there was a possibility that we may breed at some stage, but now he's um, maybe getting a little old for that now, but he's quite, he's quite settled and doesn't really display any, any regret, aggressive behaviour. Um, so we may as well leave him entire now, in, in my opinion, if, um, if we're given that, given that choice. And can I just ask one more question, Mr. Chair? Um, you mentioned you had an injury with varicose veins. I don't know how much pressure would it take to, um, for a scratch to actually cause a lot of bleeding? Uh, the, the, um, the vein was in my ankle and it was, um, it was quite swollen up at the time. Um, so it didn't need very much pressure at all. Just basically all he had to do was um, rub his claw over it would be enough to rupture it. Okay, thank you. Before we go to Liz, look, can I just follow up on that one? That particular incident in January, I believe, of 2021, uh, um, Mr. Evans states that the blood in the street occasioned subsequent police attention. Did the police um, make any contact with you at the time, Mr. Tresida? Yes, they did. They, um, the next day they followed the blood trail back to my house. <laughs> and um, I think my wife met them up on the street. And um, so that they, uh, they phoned me and um, asked what happened. I explained it to them and um, they offered to take me to hospital, but I think I was pretty much okay. The bleeding had obviously stopped by then. So it was okay. So from your point of view, there was absolutely no malice in, on the part of Breaker in regard to that, that particular incident? Absolutely not. It, it actually doesn't have anything to do with this at all. Okay, thank you. Um, Liz. Thank you and um, welcome, Mr. Trisita. Um, I was just wondering if you would like to comment on some of the things that we've heard today in the report and from the officers and you, and you haven't touched on them. So I thought if I could just ask them specifically to you, um, would you 
would you like to respond to the comments um, made regarding you being non-compliant in the past um, with regard to registration? It was one instance, um, but I guess if, um, there was something that I did read which was plural, so I'm assuming that um, uh, you are known to um, the, the LT. And um, would you also like to comment to um, the comment that's been made that Breaker is known to have been off the lead and even after this incident has been seen off the lead? Would you like to um, comment on those two questions, Mr. Trissida? Yeah, sure. Um, I think maybe last year, we had a lot going on and we um, neglected to register them by the due date. Um, but as soon as we realized, we did so. Um, as far as being off lead, we've actually, he's been a very compliant dog and we've walked him off lead for six years, um, pretty much all the time. But now that um, this incident's happened, I've learned from it and I, I, I realize um, that that was a mistake and um, these things can get out of hand quite quickly. So as I said before, he is on lead. As far as having been seen off lead, um, we do have one of those extender leads that allows the dog to walk about five meters or more away from you. And it's just a, a thin little um, rope. Um, so it may have given the impression that he wasn't on lead when he actually was. But I can guarantee you that he is being walked on lead all the time. Okay, so just so that you know, I have had dogs for years. So I do, I am aware of the, um, the tools that you are um, uh, talking about. Um, and also in another life, I was a postie in the old days, not when you had these little cars, which I would have loved to have driven around in, but I had a, had a bike. And, um, and I can tell you that we got to know the, the dogs in the different communities and which ones to be aware of. And unfortunately, I've been bitten um, a number of times by, by dogs. So um, I am aware of also the concern that um, the other party, particularly the wife, might have now about walking, um, now going for a walk. But I just wanted to pick up on your comment about why you're here because you um, don't think it's fair. And and I um, and I was quite interested in that because I note that the other party aren't here giving evidence, and so. Um, have you got a view about that? Um, yes, I have. I, I was just um, talking to the to the point that um, I was asked for a statement on what happened, um, and it seemed to have been mostly ignored. My original statement, um, whereas Mr. Evans's statement seems to be pretty much taken as what actually happened. Um, and also the, the statement that um, because I was walking away, I didn't see what happened, but it didn't actually um, reflect the fact that I also said the reason I was walking away is because George had attacked Breaker in the past or behaved aggressively towards him. So I, I just feel that um, we haven't been treated in a, a balanced and fair way. So, so do you think um, the fact that the other party aren't here giving evidence um, and being given an opportunity to refute perhaps some of the comments that, that you're making now um, is fair? Well, I, I believe that he was asked if he would like to attend, but he declined. Okay. Cool. Um, and I'd, I'd also just like to add that I, I, can, I can see it from his perspective, the fact that um, he's just been walking down the street 
lovely day, enjoying it. Next minute, he finds himself in the middle of a dog fight. Then he's injured. Um, so, you know, he's, he's afterwards, he's going to be, you know, distressed, shocked, angry. Um, yeah, so I, I do have empathy for him in that respect. And so it was raised as well, just one more, sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, it, it was raised that um, at one stage in the report that the wife had said that she was holding them and then at another time he was holding um, the dog. Um, I, I wonder if that was because um, Mr. Evans has had to intervene to break it up and that perhaps that's why um, both situations are actually true. Um, they're just, if you put it into context, would you accept that? Um, no, because the, um, the complainant statement says um, that breaker turned on him, that he attacked, the, the, if you read the complainant statement, he says that breaker attacked George he tried to break them up and then Breaker turned on him. Um, that's not what happened. And as I said, he did say that he tried to break them up, but not how he did it. And he did it by standing beside my dog and, and shoving and, and pushing his leg. He was standing with his arms out like this and he was pushing his leg into Breaker's mane while George was lunging at him. That's what I saw. I will ask a question now, um, Mr. Tressida. Um, if you've been, you say you have been walking Breaker wearing a muzzle since the end of June when he was deemed to be menacing. Now, is that, can you explain, is that a big deal when such an action is designed to ensure the safety of people and animals when he is in a public place? You Sorry, may could, you could you repeat that, please? I'm, I'm asking you, you say that you have been walking breaker wearing a muzzle so breaker's been wearing a muzzle since the end of june when he was deemed to be menacing so i'm asking is that if look if the if this committee upholds the classification that breaker is menacing then you're going to have to continue to uh, have a muzzle on him when he is being walked is that a big deal um well it's a it's an inconvenience it's, it's a big deal for him i think i would say I mean, sorry, the rest of my question was because that action is designed to ensure the safety of people and animals when he is in a public place. So that is the reason for it. Yes, I, I, I understand that. But my, um, my assertion is that he doesn't pose any danger to people in a public place. But I mean, it's up to you to um, deliberate and decide whether he has to wear that muzzle or not. And if so, we'll comply with that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, Mr. Trista, can you tell me, in your statement, you said that um, Breaker came away with a mouthful of fur. Can you just tell me what you saw of that and how you noticed that? Did you notice it as the dog came back to you? No, um, I said that George, the other dog, had a mouthful of breaker's fur. Okay. How could, if you, you were about 15 metres away. True. Is that right? That's so, right. Um, how were you able to see that clearly? There was a big piece of fur. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that really but was. Collies, collies do have a lot of fur, I'll allow. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, in the past, has Breaker regularly approached other dogs or people when they were when he was off lead? Um, not people, but dogs. Yes. Okay. Have you ever had an incident before like this where that hasn't gone well? Yes. Okay. Um, but having said that, um, when I was talking before um, about no, you know, dogs not being denaturalized. Um, he, uh, yeah, he has been um, attacked from time to time. He's, he's never been the aggressor. Right. Thank you. And then 
I just wanted to ask you this final question about the process, which is I, I really understand that you don't feel like the process has been fair. And um, what do you think, what should have happened during the process that would have made it fair to you? Like if we could go back and do it over again, what do you think that we, we should do to make sure that it was fair for you? Um, I would have liked to have known what the allegations were that were being made. Um, yes, that's, that's, that's in a nutshell, really. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Free. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chesida. I guess I want to pick up a little bit on um, Councillor Sparrow's questioning. Um, given that you say you're very, very sorry about the injury that occurred and you wouldn't want anything like that to happen again, is it such a big deal to make sure it can't happen again that um, your dog should wear a muzzle and be on a leash? It's for his protection, I would think, too, because... You know, if he is a repeat offender in this regard, it would not, I, I would think, probably not look good. So is it such a big deal if he were to have to wear a muzzle to protect everybody? Um, we're not, I don't believe that the public needs, that's one of the, another reason I'm here is because I don't believe that the, the public needs to be protected from breaking. He isn't going to bite anyone. Um, and I don't believe he has bitten anyone. Now, then, or way into the past. Um, I, you know, I've, I've decided that I'm going to keep him on a lead um, and I believe that's enough. I, mean, I believe that he's a well-behaved, compliant enough dog um, that it's, it's actually a non-issue. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, kia ora, thank you, Brian. Um, my questions are, most of my other questions have been asked by others, but I just kind of wanted to gauge your um, thinking and obviously you have a, a, a deep understanding of um, the Dog Control Act or what you would consider to be dangerous or not a dangerous behaviour in a dog. So I was just wondering if, um, you know, in the past, Breaker has been attacked by other dogs and um, if you would see you know, in, in the situation of reverse, if you were um, Mr. Evans and this had happened to your dog, would you be classifying that as menacing or do you think um, that that classification would be unfair in that case or, or how, yeah, yeah, what more would you um, need to be seen, seen in a, in a, in a behaviour for it to be classed as menacing? Where would you draw that line? Um, just in accordance with the Act, I'm, I'm seeking to understand. Um, I would say any if he showed any behaviour um, that was intimidating in any way to um, the public, whether a, you know um, if, if if he appeared frightening or you know rushed people that in a way that may have been interpreted as being aggressive. Um, that's, yeah, I guess that's what I would consider to be, because um, obviously people don't have to um, suffer injuries, I guess I'm saying. Thank you. And then just on that, because you've mentioned um, that Breaker has, has come up to greet people before, and I've been a dog owner in the past as well, and um, some can't tell if a dog's approaching you off leash, if it's got uh, good intentions. So I was just wondering around the, you know, if a dog is off leash, how does someone to know if um, a dog approaching is to be intimidating or to just have a, have a hello, um, which I know it can be a, a little bit difficult to distinguish there. Um, usually dogs with tails will have their dog, their, their tail sticking directly upwards. It's body language. Um, and obviously, what sort of noises they're making, whether they're baring their teeth, snarling, growling, that sort of thing. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Free. 
your yeah, hand. Um, oh, yeah, no, I think I, I'm not on mute. <laughs> um, Mr. Tresider, just one last question from me, and it's to do with the scooter um, rider who believes he saw um, your dog uh, and felt intimidated by it. How, how do you explain that? And I think um, it was on your street or very close to it. I note that, um, so that apparently um, came to dog control's attention on the 7th of July. Um, the incident apparently happened um, in um, November, December of 2020, the previous year. Um, so it just seems strange that he would wait um, six months and then um, also the fact that the, um, the statement that he provided, the person on the scooter, um, was dated about four days after we notified our attention to appeal. Okay, so you um, just think that it was he was being opportunistic? Well, there's a picture, a sort of a general picture of, of a rough collie um he you know it was it was like it supposedly happened i, I don't really know if, if this happened or not because it appears that the dog was on its own he, he didn't see an owner anywhere um so I, I i don't see it as being um significant to be honest and i and i believe probably that um the council team sought out this statement after they um, they found that we were going to appeal, and I, I don't think there's a, there's enough factual information in it to um, to say that it's admissible, really, to this hearing. Okay, well, I guess we can clarify whether they sought that or not, whether it was volunteered. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask the last question after Councillor Condi, but I will ask mine now because it is, relates to that particular incident. And my question is that, um, well, twofold question. The first one is, could that have been your dog in the sense that was, has your dog been allowed to wander at will or is he kept on a fenced property? Brian, that's my first question. Um, we don't have a fenced property. But he's he's kept inside with there's a couple of times when he's managed to get out. Um, so I, I would say it's not impossible. But generally he's kept inside. He's not allowed to wander on his own. Okay, thank you. And the other aspect of that is the allegation was made by the person who submitted that statement, Stephen. I've got his name somewhere, but anyway, he says someone was calling out to the no, someone was calling out, and the scooter rider assumed that calling out was to the dog. Was that you who was calling out? Um, all I can say is that it's not impossible. It could have been me. That could have been someone else as well. I don't know. <laughs> you don't. You I don't have any recollection of that. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. Yes. Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, Ms. Latresa, I guess from your point of view, what, I'm, what I think I'm hearing is that you accept that your dog, because your dog was off lead, because Breaker approached this other dog, whether it was a rush or whether it was just an approach, um, those two things is what has led to this injury, whether it was Breaker that, that bit Mr. Evans or not, leaving that aside, that the, this injury wouldn't have happened if, if Breaker hadn't been off lead and if he hadn't approached the dog. So I guess what, my question for you is, what do you believe is an appropriate consequence for that, since you are objecting to the menacing classification? Um, I would say just that, um, as I said, he's no longer off lead um, and I also have been keeping a closer eye on him I don't turn my back on him anymore even if I'm at um, say Lyle Bay walking him there which is an off lead area but I keep a close eye on him and, and try to keep him close by 
but I, I don't. I I am objecting because um, I've already said I, I I'm not entirely pleased with the council's process, and um, the fact that um, for Breaker himself, um, I don't see why he should have to wear a muzzle if he doesn't really need to. But as I've said, if that's the the wishes of the council, so be it. I assume Councillor Condi was asking that on a hypothetical basis, knowing that the um, this committee only has the authority to say yay or nay in terms of the upholding or rescinding the, and can do nothing further other than upholding or rescinding the um, classification. Quite correct, Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, look, I think it's appropriate um, at this stage, I see no further hands for us to go back to the, thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. Tresida, for answering those questions. We'll go back to the public health team to respond and the councillors to ask what questions are necessary once they have provided a response. So back to the public health and animal control people. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councillor um, Our animal control officers are very experienced and make the right decisions process that they have gone through is a robust and consistent approach. We admit there was some omissions in the paperwork, but that on the whole, it's a robust decision made correctly. Some of Mr. Tresider's uh, accounts, I, I do struggle to, um, to accept them, considering he was walking away, he had his back, and he himself constantly quoted, he didn't exactly see what happened. Um, furthermore, I did contact Mr. Evans, um, who had, as an elderly gentleman, he had suffered from this injury for a long period of time. Once he was discharged from the medical centre, he was under constant care of the district nurse. When I approached Mr. Adams, Evans to see if he wanted to um, come in, he was still appeared distressed over the situation. He advised me that he'd said all that he had to say. Um, he felt that he'd given a complete story and that he just wanted to, to uh, get over it, basically. He wanted to heal. Um, I might refer to my colleague, Damien, um, to respond to... Um, the, the bike comment Mr. Tresider made, that the bike was a Labrador and not a rough collie. Um, I'm not sure what expertise he has in this area, but I wonder if um, my colleague Damon can make some comments around the bike. Sure. Very difficult to obviously answer 100% that um, of the breed of dog that caused that injury, but what we do know from um, dog bites is that skin movement and muscle tone quite often have a lot to play with the shape of a bite. Um, and that um, can obviously change the shape of a bite. What we do have, though, is reports from a medical profession to say puncture wounds, which would indicate a bite. Unfortunately, we can't categorically say that it was this dog and that or that dog. It, it is all coming down to witness statements. Um, finally, um, just a comment regarding the um, email that was received by the scooter rider. Um, that arrived um, in our email. Um, it was out of the blue. It wasn't solicited by us at all. I believe maybe Mr. Evans had gone to the scooter rider, but I can't comment of any facts behind that. I would only assume that it was out of the blue and it was significantly similar enough for us to use it as supplementary information. It wasn't entered as evidence. Thank you. Thank you. So we're back to, well, just on that particular one, I have a question, and that is that because it was not 
substantiated. I had this question written down anyway, and I think Mr. Tressida referred to it, but is that, I mean, obviously this is not a court of law, but we do have a quasi-judicial capacity, I believe, but is, would that be admissible as evidence when it was, um, there was a lack of evidence and it was not substantiated? So um, to what degree should it be borne in mind or should it be dismissed? Uh, that's up to you to the councillors. Um, yeah, it's, it was significantly similar for us to think it had relevance and we had no reason to believe it wasn't true. But we, we, we don't know categorically that it was breaker, although the chances... No, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. No, we don't. No. But it, it could well have been because rough collies are relatively few and far between, is my understanding. But anyway, I, I guess, yeah, I won't make any further comment. That's not a, a question, I guess, so I should um, move on at this point. Um, Councillor O'Neill has a question. Um, thank you. I just wanted to follow up whether or not um, the Labrador George, as in the witness statements, may have appeared to have taken a, a bite of the other dog, um, and whether or not we received any information from the owners of the Labrador, whether they noted that their dog had um, got some collie fluff in its mouth. Or whether or not that was investigated, you know, if you get a report of um, two dogs fighting and someone being injured, whether you check for those things as well. I did check with Mr Evans and he said that his dog appeared unharmed. There was no mention from Mr Evans regarding the fluff in his dog's mouth. And Mr Evans didn't um, register that Breaker might have been injured or lost some fluff? No. At all? No, okay, cool. Um, and then uh, secondary to this, and uh, apologies, Chair, if this is not um, within the scope of questions able to be answered, but I was just wondering in your experience in dog control, um, when you're taking statements like this in the past, has there uh, been any sort of facilitated mediation when you've got two parties reporting incidents into councils? Um, and yeah, feel free, because I know it's not entirely... Um, yeah, within the statement, but I was just curious. Not in regards to a reported dog attack as such, um, no. In other uh, situations, maybe barking dogs, we have had mediation, but nothing like this for this particular offence. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if, if you could make a statement for us in response to Mr. Tresida's comment that uh, essentially that he wasn't clear on the seriousness of the complaint or the seriousness of the injury um, and that, that he would have liked to, to know the allegations being made um, against him. If you can just respond to those two comments in terms of how you believe the process was carried out. Okay, um, we always approach the um, person, uh, sorry, the um, dog owner with a very neutral aspect and we want to know their side of the thing, of the story, um, their um, review of what happened. Um, we certainly don't necessarily bring up the exact detail because that might impact their statement. Um, but when we say we're investigating, um, and we, we generally say we're investigating this um, under the Dog Control Act, um, and as Wayne said, that we will uh, look at both evidence, uh, the evidence, and make an informed decision of where we go with that. It would be unwise to assume anything or make judgment before we had both sets of statements and all, all the evidence. Thank you. Thank you. I I have um, 
two final questions. And one of those um, relates to, we've been told that Raywin Mulligan provided a statement in support of Breaker. She's been professionally involved with dogs for 40 years or so, primarily, as I understand it, um, rough collies. Now, public health was also provided with the name of a professional dog walker who would vouch for Breaker's character. Have either of these people been approached for further comment, bearing in mind certainly the expertise as I understand it, of Raywin Mulligan? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, the reason for that is the um, those pieces of information were not part of the investigation and not provided as part of the investigation. This was provided to us in, um, in regards to his objection to the, the classification. So it was information for Mr. Tresseter to bring to the hearing. Would this... I guess this one is different to most other um, instances where a dog has been classified as menacing because in those instances, the, the um, dog owner has accepted without um, objecting as in this instance. Therefore, more work is presumably needed to be done on this one. And I mean, we're, we're in essence where we are having a say on how we perceive the character of the dog or whether this dog is, is in fact, um, an aggressive dog. And would it not have been helpful to have got more information about the nature of this specific dog? Because we're not talking about the breed as a whole. We're talking about one specific dog, aren't we? Namely, Breaker. And it's our decision is being based on whether we, deter, we, whether we agree with... Um, the classification that the dog is menacing. Yes, councillor. So we took the decision that the um, report from the dog behaviourist would have been a witness for Mr. Tresider. So if that person was going to talk sort of in support of the dog's current behaviour, then we would have expected Mr. Tresider to call that person as a witness. We don't see that person as being our witness. Okay, it's. Thank you for that. Mr. Tressa might respond to that when it is his turn to, res to respond. Are there any, oh look, I do have one other question and that is, oh, would this complaint have got as far as it has if Mr. Evans hadn't been injured? So if it's basically an altercation between two dogs, unfortunately, and we're not downplaying the extent of the injury, but Mr. Evans sustained it in getting involved in the dog fight, and I can understand why he did that. But would it have got as far as if as as this if it had just been the dog fight without um, an injury sustained by a human being? Yeah, we would have to um, we go through the um, attack rating system. So I'll hand that over to Damien to answer because it's the answer that will come out of the bottom of that. Uh, yes, yeah, so the attack rating um, obviously gives us a level of between 9 and 29 to issue either a warning, a menacing classification, or an infringement, or all three. And, um, and this is at the higher level. If the owner, sorry, if the victim had not have been injured um, or no injury, that obviously would have lowered that attack rating somewhat. Um, and the other side of that is that the Dog Control Act, when a menacing classification is issued, it only has to be on the reported behaviour, not necessarily the injury caused by the dog, but just the reported behaviour of an incident that the council can deliberate over a menacing classification. So I think that both situations have been covered. Okay, thank you very much for that. I see there are no further... There is one more question from Councillor Condi. Sorry, I one do have more. one more glass question. It's just, I'd just be interested in, in your judgment about um, why you settled on the menacing classification and why you decided not to um, proceed to any kind of, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but infringement or, or prosecution under the Act. <coughs> Uh, 
Um, given that at the time of the report, we had no previous history of aggression with um, Breaker, if there had been multiple uh, um, reports of aggression um, or um, previous dog attacks or something like that, that might have obviously pushed us further over that limit. Um, but as we got to the high end of our report uh, rating, um, we did not go into dangerous classifications, nor did we proceed into um, an attack. It would also be different. It would also be um, unusual um, to take that very drast uh, drastic step when we have these tools in our possession to um, carry on, if you like. We, we have the ability to issue dangerous and menacing classifications. And I think we feel that probably the prosecutions are for the far more serious or repeat offenders. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for that. That concludes that um, part of it, and we will hand back to Brian Tresider for his um, concluding statements, responses to what has been um, come up in the last little while. Over to you, Brian. Um, yes, thank you. Um, just a couple of things. Um, the, um, the health team keep repeating um, that I was walking away and didn't see what was happening, um, which is not correct. Um, the other thing is um, I, don't, I don't believe that I was um, really approached with a neutral aspect um, it was actually slightly aggressive demeanour that um, the officer showed at the time when he arrived at my house and um, I just also as well as um, Raywin Mullane's statement, um, there was another one sent in um, by a neighbour who I don't know very well, but his first name is Jerry. Um, and another one by a, a woman who I'd met out of Tony, um, dog walking, she also sent in um, a supporting statement. So I hope oh, you okay. get it as well. But, um, Apart from that, um, Mr. Evans, you'll be glad to know, isn't still suffering too badly from his injury because I've seen him walking up the hill with bags of groceries after being down to the supermarket. Um, so he, he just don't believe that he couldn't attend the hearing because he was incapacitated. Um, but I guess he's said all he needs to say, so that's fine. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. I, thank you, Mr. Tresider. I have two more questions, but if anyone else, well, I'll ask one of them now, and that is um, maybe you didn't catch entirely what you just said, Brian, but did you consider it would have been worth your while having um, Raywin Malane, is that how you pronounce your name, or in any of these other parties who indicated to support for Breaker to be at this hearing with you because you were, were entitled to have support people? I um, just thought that their, their statements that would have hopefully been provided to the councillors would have been sufficient. Okay, thank you. I certainly read through their statements. My last question is, you have stated... Um, and I'm quoting that you believe Breaker would not have bitten Mr. Evans. Um, there are two questions here. Actually, I've got three question marks. Do you stand by that as the first one? But before you um, have the opportunity to answer that, don't you think possibly that in the heat of the moment, in the midst of a dogfight, and the word frenzied uh, was used by uh, animal control people earlier, in the midst of a frenzied dog fight, that could have happened. Don't you think that even the nicest of dogs can do something out of character 
or in, the, in a heated attack that um, that it could have been Breaker that bit Mr. Evans? Sure, I agree that's possible, but um, I just feel that um, because of where the uh, complainant was standing in relation to my dog and what he was doing and um, his position to his dog, it is I, all I've said was that it was just seemed more likely that he was bitten by his own dog. And I do accept that it, it's not entirely impossible it could have been Breaker. Just more likely it was a complainant's dog. Okay, thank you very much. I see there are no further questions. So what we will do, I'm suggesting we, we break for 15 minutes so we can have a cup of coffee or whatever. We will, uh, we will resume. That'll just be the, I'm checking out with Officer Johnson here. We, it'll just be the councillors who, councillors and um, Dem services people who return in 15 minutes. I'm not quite sure how we let everyone know once we've, our del deliberations have been um, uh, finalised, but we will put in an appearance again once they have been finalised. you have a question, Liz? I do. Um, are we not going into uh, deliberations? We will do, but it will be appropriate to have a You muted again there, Malcolm. You've kind of gone on and off and on and now we can't hear you. Oh, sorry. I, I was saying that um, some may wish to use the bathroom or have a hot drink or both. So I, I'm I don't think we need 15 minutes though. I'm just mindful that we've been on this one topic since one for you see. And it's now it's now nearly quarter past three. So okay, we well, maybe minutes? ten minutes. We'll suppose. Put your hand up if you prefer fifteen minutes or ten minutes. Ten minutes. Five minutes. Or five minutes. Five minutes. Well, if we make it, no, we will make it five minutes. But that is sharp, sharp. Five minutes. Just sharp. Make okay. it eight minutes and made it twenty past. Oh, I love okay, it. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, look. Yeah, 20 past is eight minutes. Look Seven at us eight minutes. Okay, the we'll see you then. Decide where's my gavel. Right. right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tressida. We will um, appear at a later stage. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have officers online somewhere? The uh, manual control and yes, we have Sean Clear. Right. Okay. Well, we're back into it. We have spent a considerable a considerable time discussing this, and we are now going to put the motion. So Liz is going to put that, and we will have a seconder, and then we'll debate. Okay. So I move. The recommendation is that we receive the information. We note the evidence which formed the basis for the classification, any steps taken. Am I reading the whole lot? Does that form the whole recommendation? Or, or can I just say that um, I move that we uphold the recommendation of the officers? Right, and we have a seconder. Councillor O'Neill. Actually, Liz, you have the opportunity to um, speak at this point, then we'll have a second to speak, and then we'll go into debate. I do. Okay. Um, well, I'd just like to um, thank everybody for the time that they've put in to having this matter heard and for the process um, that we have participated in today. Um, and I just wanted to support the officer's recommendation um, that the behaviour was menacing and that in order to safeguard the safety of the public, um, that breaker will need to be muzzled. Um, 
in future when he's in a public place. And I'd like to thank my colleagues as well for the discussion. Thank you, Liz. Councillor O'Neill, do you wish to speak at this point? Thank you, just briefly um, to speak in support of upholding the officer's decision to conclude that the dog is menacing in this case um, and to acknowledge uh, Mr. Tresida, um, Mr. Evans and Isabel, and of course um, the two dogs, Breaker and George, for what I imagine would not be a very nice day um, on the event that it occurred and all of the due diligence that um, dog officers and other members of the community have done to kind of engage in this process and noting that this is a new process. Um, and then lastly, to just kind of acknowledge um, points on both sides today about um, more things that we can do to better care for our animals and the way that we regulate them and um, behave in the past. I've been, a, I'm a big dog loving um, person. Most of my colleagues know that um, as uh, other members of the committee and um, I'm satisfied that the decision today will be for the best of the dog community and hopefully, you know, um, with the muzzle and some, some more education around this, um, we won't be seeing too many more menacing dogs. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that. We will have opportunity for others to comment. I wish to say a few things at this point. I'll put my hand up, but um, I would like to thank Animal Control and Public Health for all the work that has gone into this and for the job that they do. The thank, thankless efforts that they, the, the time and effort that they put in. I um, don't envy what they have to do and I wish they were uh, more fully resourced. I Obviously we regret that this incident ever happened and I hope if Mr. Evans is looking at this or sub subsequently sees it, that um, he is fully re, uh, healed from both the injury physically and, and mentally. And it's just a, it's a pity that it ever happened and there were circumstances that if, um, if yeah, it should not have happened. It did. I have given this a, a, a lot of thought and um, my initial expectation was that this would be a clear cut case involving a not particularly nice dog, but in my view, it has not been a clear cut case at all. And I, I don't feel personally that there has been sufficient evidence provided beyond this one unfortunate incident, and I'm not downplaying the extent of the injury, to substantiate the allegation that this is an aggressive dog deserving of the menacing classification. I personally don't believe he is and that he would be um, he could be safely walked unmuzzled in the future. That is my view. And therefore, I will not be voting to uphold the menacing classification. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Councillor Condi. Thank you. Um, I guess I'd just like to start by thanking Animal Services and saying to, to the team who have been with us, thank you for um, answering all our questions with a lot of patience. Um, it, it, we did ask you some really challenging questions today and that's, that's not a situation I particularly like to be in, particularly in public. Um, but I think it was important for Mr. Tresida to see that we were taking his request for a review very seriously and that we were asking really um, challenging questions of our staff. And I wanna thank you very much for all the answers that you gave us today. Um, while I think it, it's shown that we found maybe a couple of places we could have done a little bit better and there's a learning opportunity perhaps around some of the paperwork, it's the first time we've had to do an appeal like this. And we recognize that you've also got resourcing challenges. Um, but any of those, those minor issues don't um, change the underlying decision that you have made, um, which, which we see as well, which is that while it is possible um, that, that it was George that bit Mr. Evans. On the balance of probabilities, it does seem like it was Breaker. Um, and that, for me at least, it, it's an issue of kind of what's my least regrets going forward. Um, and my least regrets is that a little bit of inconvenience to Breaker and, and the owner in terms of being muzzled in public um, versus the chance that another incident like this might happen. 
Um, and just want to say um, to Mr. Tresider that I'm, I'm, you know, sorry that you felt that you felt the process didn't really hear you the first time. And that I hope that the amount of we've certainly um, taken it very seriously. Your appeal um, when we were deliberating, a number of councillors talked about having lost a bit of sleep over this, which I definitely did last night as well. Um, and a number of hours that we spent, um, you know, going over all of the evidence. So I just wanted to say to Mr. Treasurer that. We have taken this very seriously, even though um, the decision that we're coming out with today is probably not the one that you would have liked to see. Um, and just thank you to everybody. Thank you, Councillor Condi. Anyone else wish to speak? Do we want a right of reply to Liz? Okay, on that basis, um, I'm looking for my little hand to put up or not put up, but anyway, let, let, let us vote. Um, the recommendation is that we uphold the menacing classification. So put your hand up, thumbs up or thumbs down. Okay, that is carried. Thank you very much. And we, the meeting, we will close the meeting with the karakia. Councillor Pundi will be reading the closing karakia for us. Yes. Unuhia, 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 kite uru tapunui. Kia watea, kia mama, te ngako, te tinana, te warua, ite ara takatu. Koya ra erongo, faka eria, akikironga, kia watea, 